Hello. My name is Tracy Green. I'm the clinical manager from Sigbar Risk Group Britain. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. Uh, this is our latest MOH um, session, which is on lipedema, a multidisciplinary approach. And I think we all can um, understand that from a lipidema point of view and management, we do need to have a multidisciplinary approach so that we can manage these patients effectively. I'd really like to welcome to join, joining me today in moderating this session, um, Dr. Mohammed Omar El Farouk from um, Cairo, um, a highly ex experienced and um, specialist vascular consultant. So it's really lovely to be working with you again. Welcome, and I'm gonna hand you over now to Dr. Omar to continue the session. Thank you, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, for the kind introduction. I'm really honored and uh, very pleased today to be part of a global um, expert ring in a very recent field of lipidemia. Uh, I guarantee uh, all the attendees will enjoy a very fruitful couple of hours that sure will have a lot of uh, new medical knowledge and medical advice. Let me present our two excellent global uh, speakers and the two uh, excellent uh, global panelists. We are trying to squeeze about a hundred years of expertise in different continents. So it's very enjoyable. The first speaker from Brazil is uh, Professor Fabio Kamamoto from Brazil. He is a previous president of General Surgeon, Plastic Surgeon Hospital of Das Quirinax de San Paulo. He also has a master's degree in plastic surgery to give a lot of impact on the cosmetic part of this disease. He also have a PhD in very interesting topic of healing in 2017. He has a great experience in multiple fields of plastic surgery, and one of that field is lipedema. He is also a full member of the Brazilian Society of Plastic Surgery. Uh, our second uh, great speaker uh, is Professor Thomas Wright from United States, and he's very well known in lipedema uh, field from his great research and great new ideas. He is a medical director of Laser and Vein uh, Center in United States. He's one of the first uh, to have a diploma from the uh, American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Disease. He also have authored and presented several papers in the new surgical techniques of venous disease and venous insufficiency. And he has received multiple awards about his new innovation. And uh, I guarantee he will add a lot of the, the knowledge and the expertise and the future in that field. I'm also delighted to present our two um, great panelists. Uh, first one from Germany, uh, Dr. Gabriella Farber. Uh, she has graduated from a school in Heidelberg, and she also have experience from South Africa. She had a scholarship from the German National Academic Foundation and uh, from city of Meinheim. Uh, she's also an experienced phlebologist in Hamburg. Uh, over 20 years, so she will give us a great reflection from her past experience with this disease in Europe. She also has been involved in the German guidelines uh, on that disease from the German Society of Pharmacology. I'm also delighted to have a very dear colleague uh, from India, uh, Dr. Pavithra Radhi, uh, very well known uh, uh, experience in physiotherapy of that disease. She has been graduated from RV College of Physiotherapist, and she had a master's degree in Ops and Gaina uh, Physiotherapy from uh, Manipal University. She is certified CDT uh, consultant, complete decompression therapy, both our limp, lower limp, difficult cases of the neck and multiple field. And I always said I've learned a lot from physiotherapists, especially in this lipedema uh, field. Um, she also worked in a private center of lymphedema in Bangalore. 
Uh, having said that, uh, I'm delighted to have all the attendee. We would like to have all your questions. Either you can put it on the chat, you can put it on question and answer button, or you can raise your hand if you want to voice. Uh, always say this global network is always enriched by your participation. We prefer your question to be in Q&A because this time we all can see it and we all can reply for it. And uh, uh, I'm very eager for your contribution. So uh, the mic now will be to our uh, first uh, speaker, Professor Fabio Kamamoto in Brazil. Uh, the mic is yours and we are all ears. Hello. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here with you. And I'm going to be uh, speaking about our experience here in Brazil and a very practical idea of how to treat lipedema here. So I'm going to share my screen. Do you all see the presentation? Is it okay? Is it okay, yes, Dr. Omar? Okay. Yes, okay, good. So okay. thank you again. I'm plastic surgeon here in Brazil. And my story with lipedema started 10 years ago when I first met this young lady, and Talita told me a sad story. She told me that she was very annoyed about her small waist and fat legs, and she didn't uh, manage to, to deal with that. She had often bruises, heaviness on the legs, often pain, and it got worse after the use of contraceptives. And it caused a lot of emotional stress and a feeling of guilty. And she told me that, uh, she had lipedema, and that was the first time that I heard that, that word. And she asked me to do the, a liposuction on her legs. And 10 years ago, especially in Brazil, it was a very initial experience. They didn't, there, there was not much literature about that, but we, we did it. So that day, we took out five liters of fat from her legs. This is the after the surgery. And surprisingly, she told me that her life got better. She had less bruises, less heaviness on the legs, and it improved the quality of life. And it was very, very special and very interesting to me because it was the first time that I started thinking about liposuction as a tool to improve the health, to improve the function of the legs. So it really changed my view about my profession. And since then, I've been working almost every day with lipedema. So what's lipedema? It's a disease. It's a chronic disease from the adipose tissue. Um, it's characterized by this proportion about the, the position of this fat. It uh, affects the extremities, the lower limbs, the upper limbs, and also cause a lot of emotional impact. Um, although it's very, very common, it's believed that it affects 10% of the adult women in the world, which is about 10 million women here in our country. And it has only been recognized as a disease by the World Health Association since 19, 2019, sorry. And it was adopted here in Brazil last January. So now we can officially say that lipedema is recognized as a disease in our country. And unfortunately, it's not uh, known by many patients, even by the health professionals, and it's not covered by our public health system. So the diagnosis is based on the story of the patient. She always complains about pain, about uh, something that goes to their legs, but it spares the hands and the feet. That's why they have what we call cankles. Um, they often have hematoma formation, and the size of the legs doesn't uh, slow, uh, shorten even with weight reduction. That's why it's very stressful for these patients. Um, it's not uh, yet fully believed uh, the, 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 the causes of the disease. Uh, we often see that there is a genetic predisposition. So 60% of the patients have a relative with lipedema, but the onset is caused by hormones. So there is a uh, strict relationship with estrogen. And it worsens with lymphatic, broad capillaries, and inflammatory uh, crisis. Uh, it's divided in five types. 
In type one, it affects the navel and the hips. In type two, it goes from the pelvis to the knees. And in type three, it goes from the pelvis to the ankle, so the whole lower limb. In type four, it affects the upper limb. And in type five, it takes only the cuffs. But what's um, stressful for the patients is that it's a chronic and progressive disease. So from time to time, it goes from stage one, which is the volume, to stage two, where we can see walnut-sized nodules on the legs. And in stage three, the skin starts being compromised. There is the formation of the, the tides and the legs. And finally, the final stage of the disease is stage four, where we can see the lymphatic damage also. So it's progressive and it's very stressful to see, for example, for a patient, a young patient, that her uh, grandmother is in stage three, for example. So the treatment is basically divided in two pillars, what you call conservative treatment. And that's why uh, this speech is very, very important. I, I believe that the, 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 the saying the in is very uh, 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 close to our objectives that to make a uh, multidisciplinary approach because what we need in fact is to try to change the lifestyle of the patient either to reduce inflammation less pain less bruises less heaviness on the legs either to prepare this patient for a later surgery and after the surgery also to keep their long-term results so we always try to uh, work with the lifestyle of this patient, which is a simple idea, very, but in practice, it's very complicated to improve. And so the pillars of the treatment are an anti-inflammatory diet, um, regular physical activities, especially low impact ones, uh, when possible to avoid sex hormones because estrogen and progesterone is the trigger for this disease. And uh, some supplements that are still is under study and it's not fully uh, comprehensive and fully proved that they have uh, actual uh, effects on the disease. So of course that it's not done only by me. So in our institute, we have uh, two vascular surgeons, we have endocrinologists, nutritionists, and also physical therapists. So I'm very thankful for, for this team. And I'm going to speak a little bit about each of us, or to, um, Claudia is our nutritionist, and our, uh, our idea is that lipedema is an inflammatory disease, and inflammation can be managed by healthy habits, and our typical Western pattern of diets is a lot of sugar, a lot of fat, a lot of artificial products, and it worsens the, the inflammation. So one suggestion is to adopt um, what we call Mediterranean diet, which is based in holy grains, in nuts, more vegetables, to try to substitute the butter for olive oil, fish, and less meat, less fat. So this is uh, less alcohol, of course. And it's interesting, uh, this is a 20, sorry, 2021 study. Uh, uh, try to understand the effect of this diet on these lipedema patients. So they started, uh, the study started to uh, improve the 40% of carbo, 30% of proteins, especially vegetable proteins, and 30% of fat. And the 29 patients studied uh, with a plant-based diet with fruits, holy grains, and vegetables. Uh, less sodium and 25 grams of fibers showed that they had less pain, less swelling, um, a reduction of the fat on the legs, but a maintenance of the muscle mass. So we all should adopt this kind of idea, but especially the lipedema patients are very uh, happy with this, with this diet. Um, this is our physical uh, therapist. And she works with clinical therapy in order to reduce pain for these patients, in order to modulate inflammation, to manage edema, and of course, also to improve aesthetics. And this is a very uh, connected to uh, Sigvaris work because she uses a lot of techniques that is in line with your products. 
So she works with uh, drainage lymphatic, intermittent pneumatic compression, biomodulation. Uh, so these are some examples. Uh, there are some light wavelengths that um, improves the, 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 the leg, reduces the inflammation. So this is an example. This is what they call in dermology, which is a kind of maneuver to free the fascia from the muscle, to release the fascia and improves the inflammation. Uh, they also work a lot of pulling out the fluids by drainage lymphatic, especially after the surgery. Bandaging, which is also in line with your products, wraps, bandaging, and intermit intermittent pneumatic compression. So this all uh, gives a better quality of life for these patients. Um, I, we are going to have Dr. Thomas that are going to, to show us uh, a better uh, example of this. Uh, this is our endocrinologist, Andre, uh, works with obesity. I'm going to be very stressful with this uh, idea that obesity is not lipedema, but sometimes they are together in these patients. And he also works with hormones orientation. So these are different conditions, in fact, and there are a lot of prejudice over these patients because uh, lipedema is completely different for obesity. This is a very a strong case with an American patient that has anorexia, has bulimia, and she still kept the fat of her legs in spite of almost dying of hunger. So she does a lot of campaigns in the internet saying that we should, we must, in fact, differentiate lipedema from obesity because it causes a lot of stress with no uh, work for these patients. And this is another patient of mine which was working out 10 times per week, every morning and every evening, making training. Uh, she managed to, to eliminate the fat from her abdomen, but her leg didn't respond to that. And finally, this is another patient of mine that lost 35 kilos of fat after the bariatric surgery, but she still kept the fat from her legs. So this is a condition that we have to, to stress and this is something that causes a lot of um, stress to the patients that they, they, they feel that this, it's their guilty to have this disease. And it's not, it's a um, genetic disease that's answering to hormones. So there is no, no problem with her style in these uh, extreme cases, but if a disease that it's not their guilty. And this is our vascular surgeon. And we often work together doing the surgery, the surgery at the same day. So often Victor starts the surgery by working with the varicose veins. She does, he does the varicose vein surgery. And just after we start to remove the lipedema uh, by the liposuction. So the surgery of uh, lipedema is uh, done by this journey. The patient starts by doing the diet, physical activities, but unfortunately, it's usually able only to remove 10% of the fat from the legs, a 10% reduction. After that, when the patient has this established, we oriented her to go to the surgery where we can remove up to 40% of the volume of the legs. And then the patient goes back to the diet and goes back to the physical activities for her life. And according to the last year's um, American guideline to treat lipedema, the surgery is the only available technique to remove these abdominal cells. So what we believe is that we should join these techniques, the conservatory treatment and the surgery to have the best results. Uh, these are some studies uh, that um, uh, stress the, 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 the paper of the surgery. So this is an American study from 2021 with 128 female patients. And a lot of them reported a better quality of life, 86%, better mobility, 96%, and of course, volume reduction after the surgery. And there are also some bridge studies. We follow up for 80 years, Dutch studies also, showing that these good results keep for life.
So even after eight years of the surgery, the patient refers a better quality of life, 84%, better improve, objective improvement, less pain, less bruises, and also subjective improvements. So what they do is a surgery, a big proportion liposuction, like in this case, where we worked on the legs. We do a technique that's called lymphatic sparing technique, which is to use small cannulas in a movement parallel to the leg in order to avoid damage from the lymphatic. And this is just a curiosity, but uh, due to the nodules that they have the fat, we have a lot of obstruction on the cannulas. So even the, the, the more the patient has fibrosis, the more they have nodules. So it's difficult to do liposuction sometimes because it, there is a lot of obstruction of the cannulas. So we have to keep uh, cleaning it every time during the surgery. That's why we finish the surgery by uh, manual removal of the fat because these nodules are so big that the cannula cannot remove it. So at the end of the surgery, this is when we did the surgery on the left leg and not uh, still on the right leg. We removed it is the 80 liters of fat. These are the nodules. And this is the result after three months. Um, I believe that the, the, the removal of the fat uh, improves, of course, the shape and the weight of the legs, but the skin laxity is a problem on the tights. So we, we, sh we, we see often this problem of the, the skin. That's why sometimes we have to work with technologies to improve the production of the collagen of, on the legs. There are some uh, technologies that are doing uh, uh, the augmentation of the, the collagen production by heating the skin. This is an example with laser. We are heating the skin, monitoring the temperature with a thermal camera to avoid burns. And in bigger cases, in like stage three lipidemas, we have to remove the excess of skin and do bigger liposuctions and also laser. So in a case like this, we do all we have. This is, for example, an, um, an eight liters of fat removal, three kilos of skin removal, laser. This is the result after three months. And then we went back to the surgery to work on knees and legs. And we removed seven liters of fat from the legs. And this is the result after six months. So a 20 kilos removed, removal from the legs, from the lower limbs. Some cases, the result on the legs, five liters of fat removal, the result after one year. That's why they say that their life has improved the quality of life because they feel more normal. You see, you can, they can use boots, they can use some shoes that they, they couldn't use before. Um, this kind of patients has a lot of stress because it's impossible to take a bus, it's impossible to take a plane with the, this kind of shape of the tights. So an 11 liters of fat removal from this to this result, result, and then again, another surgery. So it's stepped surgeries in bigger cases, uh, almost 10 liters of fat from the legs and the knees and to reach this result. So we found that the, the Lipidema Brazil Institute because it's a very, very big problem here in our country. Uh, in fact, this is the first institute focused on lipedema, and our mission is really to transform this reality of these patients here because it's said there is no knowledge about this, there is not specialized treatment for these patients. So we work with, on assistance, of course, but also education. That's why I'm so thankful for this opportunity today. And also I'm very proud of our uh, social transformation program. So as I said, we have a multi-specialty team so the, 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 the speech goes with our philosophy of work. Uh, we also work on research and education. This was, I'm very happy to, 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 to inform that this publication was uh, uh, done last, year, last week. So showing the lymphatic improvement after the surgery, 
So this is interesting to see that the surgery may also work on the lymphatic system, not only on the fat of the patient. And I'm very, very thankful to Sigvaris for the support because you are working very much with our NGO. Our NGO is working with the education for the patients, trying to fight for the right for these patients, and also offering free treatments. So this was a campaign that we are doing. This it was last week's uh, photo from a park from, uh, from Sao Paulo, where we are going to, 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 to try to, to show the population that there is something called lipedema. We uh, managed to join 200 people at the park. And this is our next patient that's going to, to go the, to do the free surgery. Uh, Tamir is, is a warrior. She does CrossFit every morning in spite of her 200 kilos of fat. And thanks to Sigivaris, we are going to do her free surgery next month. She has a stage four lipedema with the lymphatic damage on her legs. So as a conclusion, I'd say that the most important mission that I believe is still to, to do the awareness about lipedema. It's not well known by the health professionals. It's a very little known in our country. So we are really fighting to democratize the access to the treatment here in Brazil. We are trying to do the access to the, our public system for the lipedema patients. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to show my, my work here. And we are very hard trying to, to spread the knowledge and the training also for health professionals. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabio. That was really great presentation with the great cases and the great strategy. Uh, and I hope to have the impact of the all uh, my uh, co-manager and my panelists and my speakers as well as audience. But let me start first by poll question that will ask all the attendee. This is the poll question. Uh, uh, and I will say it, uh, different treatment modality are included in the multidisciplinary approach for epidema, except anti-inflammatory medication, physical exercise, excessive sex hormone dosage, and diosmine. So which one of these four options is not correct? Please uh, put your vote, and we'll see the result shortly. And we have another poll question, and then I will take the opinion of my um, co-moderator, my panelists, my speakers as well. Choose will take about 30 seconds to collect all your replies. And his answer was in the lecture. It's a beautiful lecture by Fabio. So 60% uh, got the correct answer, uh, well, which, is, uh, which is very good because uh, sex hormone is not work with your advantage, you should avoid them in conservative management. So if we take the uh, other poll question, poll question number four, um, a Mediterranean diet modification has several advantages excluding. It, it can help you to have less pain. It will help you to have less swelling. Patient will not develop cancer and it will keep your muscle mass. So which one of these four are not correct? Again, we'll give 30 seconds. Uh, it's a fascinating lecture, Fabio. I really congratulate you on your teamwork, your result, and your strategy. Thank you very much. I I'm trying to develop this system here in Brazil. So this is something that we should do worldwide. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why this is a global uh, global uh, Sigvaris group talk, and hopefully this will encourage you, all of us, to uh, pull in one direction. I think in the UK as well, we, we have um, a few issues where 
NICE have said that more research is needed into liposuction for lipedema. Um, yes. And we're finding a lot of our patients are going abroad for surgery because they can't yes. actually access it in the UK. So I do think the more research we can get, uh, we can actually start getting um, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence to, to take notice and, and really push forward for surgery in the UK. Excellent, excellent. So, really good. so uh, the poll question, uh, 70 per 71 percent got the answer correct because this uh, modified Mediterranean diet does not uh, prevent you from having cancer. So uh, thank you very much. I would like to, first of all, uh, get my uh, co-moderator, Tracy, your feedback about the lecture. Uh, I, I think it's not covered by NHS to have lipedema treatment that's why they go abroad because it is expensive to do the operation in the uk exactly i think what what's happened was they did some research or they they did uh, um, some literature searching some systematic reviews and found that they didn't think that the research was substantial enough to be yeah. able to make a judgment to say that yes liposuction should be available on the nhs it is um available for lip for life sorry lymphedema but again, okay. a lot of it's done privately because a lot of the clinics aren't able to um, to offer it on the NHS as well due to costs, etc. So I think, you know, there is a lot more that we need to do. We okay. need to bring forward the results from from the research, you know, not just from the images, but also from the patient's perspective and psychologically how it's affecting them, what results it has, what what quality of life improvements they are getting following the uh, the treatment they're receiving so yeah the more work you can do dr fabio the better please yeah excellent <laughs> and uh, the speaker professor uh, thomas wright do you like to add your uh, very valuable feedback you you're muted probably you need to unmute well, I, uh, Dr. Kamamoto, that was that was lovely. That was just a, a great talk. I, it's uh, it really will dovetail well with with what I have to say, but but yeah, a comprehensive approach, and then uh, and and very excellent work with the the surgery. Yeah, excellent. And uh, Gabriella Farber, I'd like to uh, very uh, excited to know your views. You've been treating this condition 20 years, and how is the situation in Germany? Is it reimbursed or not? Uh, yeah, I just want to, to start with thanking Fabio for his, for his excellent presentation. I agree with almost everything. I have a big comment in a minute. I asked the directory um, question that you posed concerning the reimbursement or the coverage. Um, as you might know, Tracy, there's um, an ongoing RCT in Germany. Um, the results are expected, unfortunately, later later than we thought he would, they would in 20, I think in 25, end, end of 25. And the reason for that being that there have been multi, um, monocenter studies that you know, like Schmeller and, 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 and Rapprich and Corneli, um, but they were not deemed uh, sufficient for the, um, the equivalent of the national health system. We've got a different system um, to cover them. So now they, they, we, we are having this, this study um, and we hope uh, by the time the results come out, it will be clear that liposuction is um, the, the, the more efficient because they compare conservative versus um, uh, liposuction, of course. Um, the trouble is that normally when something like that is done, um, it will be reimbursed, but at a very low financial level. So I, I'm afraid, I'm very much afraid that those who are experienced and know how to do it, have known for, for years, they probably won't be able to do it at a um, reason. But we'll have to see. Um, my, few comments on your fabulous um, presentation have you are um, that I think I, I was I must say I, I have been most impressed by your clinical cases we don't see cases like the, for instance the the last one you said you the, the one that is going to be operated on um, as your next cases like that very often um, that brings me to my point uh, I think it's it, it, there might be 
um, difference in ethnicity or so to whether they develop these huge amounts of time. Normally in Germany, what, what, what I would like to stress to, to, for everybody to tell their patients is that when a young girl is seeking your advice, you shouldn't tell them that uh, it's necessarily progressive. Uh, there's a lot they can do. And the most important thing, of course, is to, to keep their weight in a, a normal range. Although, of course, the BMI is not a good tool to, to, to judge that. But um, to, to try and uh, I, I have had girls crying because they looked uh, online and saw those pictures and they, they thought they'd all look like it. So that's my first uh, comment. It's not necessarily uh, progressive. The weight is compressive. Uh, uh, progressive. And then, as far as mentioning, um, you know, I've been, I've been treating, uh, I've been doing nutritional therapy of lipedema for 15 years now. And my experience is that it is really very, very good and very wise to use an anti-inflammatory approach. But I don't go along with the type of Mediterranean diet that you showed, because my experience is, and this has been confirmed by studies in, Amer in the United States, in Norway, uh, and, and in, in Italy, actually, um, that it is um, much more efficient to cut down the carbs, to go on a very low carb diet, uh, and combine that with the, with the anti-inflammatory um, uh, approach, because carbs by themselves are pro-inflammatory, insulin resistance is pro-inflammatory, so if you reduce the carbs, and I always call this a, a reset uh, trial, you know, for my patients, then we can reduce um, symptoms even more. Uh, and then we can find out after, after we've reached the optimum, we can try how, how many, what sort of carbs uh, can they tolerate. My last point is, uh, as you said, it's very important to, to, to stress the point that um, lipidema doesn't cause obesity and that was lipidema. There's a strong opinion in Germany at the moment for colleagues of mine who really reduce it to psychological problems and, and, and obesity, and that is the wrong approach. That is something one has really to, to, to state clearly. And the, about the bariatric surgery, there is um, a small study um, um, on bariatric, on, on, on patients who underwent bariatric surgery, they lost a lot of volume, sometimes 50 kilos, but their symptoms didn't decree, uh, decrease. Mm. So that is another point. And again, I'm contradicting uh, some of my own colleagues who say it helps. And I think Tracy knows who, who am I citing. Um, I, uh, it has to lose volume, doesn't decrease the symptoms. That's my last comment. Thank you very much. And I'm very honored to be able to give my opinion here. And I look forward to Tom's um, next presentation. Thank you very much. That is great, very valuable point uh, that you enlightened us. And uh, mm, uh, our uh, dear uh, co-panelist, uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, do you like to add your comments? Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Omar uh, for the kind uh, introduction. And I would also like to thank Sigwaris for uh, giving me this opportunity to participate as an expert panelist. Uh, now, I would like to thank Dr. Fabio for such an informative presentation. Uh, I would really appreciate uh, how he included patients with lipedema and obesity as well as lipedema and anorexia. That is something very rare because usually whenever we talk about lipedema, patients, um, people only consider obesity as, a, uh, as an associated factor. But here he also included patients with lipedema as well as anorexia. That was really nice. Uh, so I have few com uh, I have see a few comments from a physiotherapist perspective. Uh, so as Dr. Uh, Fabio rightly included, uh, complex uh, or uh, complete decongestive therapy, it is an integral part of the holistic approach or the multidisciplinary approach for patients with lipedema and more so in lipolymphedema. Uh, uh, as we all know, CBT has four components. If I have to mention a few uh, comments uh, according to the components of the CDT, uh, when we start MLD or uh, when we start with uh, compression garments, it's always better to start with something that is low pressure considering their uh, symptoms of pain to palpation. 
since they have a lot of tenderness it would be great to go uh, slow and uh, another uh, um, another component is exercise which is a very important part of cdt uh, so uh, uh, what we do generally clinically is we advise and prescribe low intensity exercises considering their nature of chronic inflammatory state so a low intensity exercise is much more suitable because of their chronic inflammatory state uh, so just uh, another comment I, i would like to add a very important aspect is to set realistic goals before we uh, commence the treatment especially in patients with lipolymphedema when they start seeing a uh, good reduction initially which is primarily reduction of the uh, lymphatic accumulation they tend to expect the same rate of reduction throughout so setting realistic goals will be uh, the best um, in terms of compliance as well as their mental health so these were my comments i just have two questions to ask dr fabiola i'm sorry dr fabio uh, so my first question is Uh, what is the criteria to decide if the patient will receive conservative treatment or surgery and my second question is uh, what pre op and post op care in terms of self care do you incorporate in patients who undergo surgery thank you okay thank you for the comments uh, what i believe is that every every patient has to do the conservative treatment that's the the starting point and i i believe that dr gabriel is right so if we have a good result with the conservative uh, treatment it's okay because in fact it's impossible to uh, do the surgery in 10% of the women of the world so no health system is able to do that and i believe that is a, almost a question of philosophy also that we have to be uh, responsible for our health so eating well doing exercises is something that's important for all of us especially for this kind of patients so if we have a, a good result if the conservative treatment i believe that is going to it's okay um one point only is that there are some triggers that are not in the hand of the patient for example pregnancy or for example menopause so even if a person is very disciplined with diet and exercises one day she may get pregnant one day she will have menopause and then maybe she will get worse of the lipidema even with this effort so but as are in you doctor i believe that everybody has to do the conservative treatment especially the lipidema patients but even us you know eating well doing exercises this is essential okay Thank you very much. Um, I also have two questions from the attendee. The very question from Josefina Carvalho. She mentioned, uh, is the lymphatic damage seen in patients with lipidema due to microaneurysm of the lymphatic vessel due to obesity, or is it due to disproportionate adipose tissue? What's your answer, Fabio? well good to, good question and <laughs> I, i don't know in fact that uh, the, the the comprehension of lipedema is not fully understood so yes there is the lymphatic damage we see also microaneurysm on the biopsy but we do not know if what what's the beginning is the fat uh, damaging the lymphedema uh, the lymphatic system or is the microaneurysm of the lymphatic system Uh, 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 enlarging the fat cells. So we see these two phenomena together, but we're not sure what, what's the, the, the beginning of the disease. But yes, uh, advanced lipedema uh, stage four has the lesion of the lymphatic system. But sorry, uh, it's nothing that I, I don't know the, the, the answer for sure yet. Okay. The second question from the attendee is from Angela uh, Belinsky. Uh, her question is, has any research reported that lipedema start at a certain age? That's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. And what we usually see in the story of this patient is it starts in adolescence. So at, it starts with the hormones. This is the first trigger. 
So yeah. uh, usually the child is okay, but when the, the girl is 12, 13 and starts having uh, hormones, so the, the, that's the first trigger for the disease. Yeah. So that's why yeah. it's very, very rare to affect men. The lipidema doesn't affect men because it may have the genetic problem, but doesn't have the hormones usually. Yeah. So, okay. And one final question from my side. Um, there is a new technique, as you know, Fabio, which is laser lipolysis, yeah. where the technique is you put uh, laser fiber under the skin uh, using diode and in the egg, and you get lysis to fat cells. They said the advantage that uh, it also encourage collagen deposition so prevent the skin wasting so i know that you are experienced in liposuction have you used this technique or do you think there is a future of laser in lipolysis yes of course yes there is a very good uh, uh, paper in the world laser laser um, because it may uh, reduce the fat laser yep. uh, reduction and also to shrink the skin also so it's I, I believe that laser is a very big tool for us to to help these lipidema patients especially the surgery on the tights excellent thank you very much uh, i hope we cover a question for attendee and for panelists and we're all eagerly waiting for the great uh, lecture by Professor Thomas Wright from the United States. And uh, thank you very much because I know it's uh, early morning in USA and we're eagerly uh, waiting for your lecture and you can start. Okay. Uh, wait, um, hold on one second. I'm trying to share here. Shit. Trying to get in the slideshow. Do you can yeah. you see my screen? Is it in? Is it? Uh, are you seeing the the we slideshow? We see it in the presenter in the presenter mode. Okay. All right. Um, then let me see if I can switch. Let me uh, uh, hold. I'm. My apologies. That's all right. It's all right. Take your time. I just would like to announce right. that we have uh, more than uh, right. hundred participant, and the social media is, is full of uh, attendee to this lecture. Now we can see your presentation one large full screen. You can go ahead, my dears. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much uh, uh, for the invitation and to to be part of this uh, this august and 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 very distinguished panel. Um, and I've. Um, and I'm, I'm learning lots as well as have a little to share. So um, just talking about compression and uh, compression in lipedema is is poorly understood and um, and not as not as well implemented as, as we want. So we're um, so uh, and I do have these are my disclosures. Um, um, I I have had some uh, support for uh, educational talks and and research. Um, so the benefits of compression um, uh, in lipedema are it helps smooth cu cuffs and lobules, uh, improves mobility, uh, decreases pain, uh, has anti-inflammatory uh, properties, uh, improves venous and, and lymphatic uh, function, in, 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 which improves the health of the skin, and helps maintain the benefits of um, of MLD pumps and surgeries. Um, so um, this is this is uh, by uh, a study by Atan, and he uh, showed decreased uh, pain. Uh, Thomas, we, we can see uh, your adjustment setting for Zoom, and that's it. That's it. Now we can see your screen full. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. It's, uh, every <laughs> part of your slide is very important to us. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so so this this study uh, showed that uh, just compression, uh, uh, different modalities of compression and exercise uh, decreased pain in uh, lipedema um, patients. And hold on one second, okay. And then and then they he also showed uh, in 2021 his study showed that the decreases leg size um, in 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 lipedema. 
Um, and then this is a study I did uh, where we were looking at uh, just measuring volume by calf circumference measurements. And we uh, showed about a 2% decrease with compression and then uh, adding uh, pneumatic compression pumps. We, in some, in some areas, we doubled it. Um, um, however, uh, surprisingly, it actually, the, with the compression pump, we actually did have a slight increase in the hip um um measurement which was unexpected um, um and then uh in in the study we also looked at bioimpedance and just a little introduction about bioimpedance so bioimpedance is a minute electrical uh um signal that goes through in um high it, it's at very various frequencies high frequency goes through everything and lower frequency uh uh just stays outside the cell and so with that we can kind of uh, we can measure um and then and then when we put elect the electrodes on the feet versus and the uh the hands we can measure it in segments and we um so we can see the intracellular and extracellular water that way and in in uh in the study we we did see that um the <clears throat> the extracellular to total body water which is essentially the um um the the water outside the cell versus all the water uh decreased in in the uh with in with compression in the lipedema patients now it, the delta was um uh just uh, zero point zero zero seven, but that's actually a pretty close to the different the the change you would see between a normal limb and the limb with uh, lymphedema. So just to give you that perspective. Um, so again, I'm back to this extracellular water. That's that's going to be um, that's your plasma, your interstitial fluid, and your lymph. Uh, but you know, your plasma volume is tightly regulated. So basically, those extracellular waters are your your interstitial fluid and your lymph changes. Um, so there's evidence of limb, limb, uh, interstitial edema in this study and in other studies. Um, so it really, I really think of uh, uh, of lipedema on a there's a continuum of of it, it, it the lymphatic function is on a continuum with uh, actual lymphedema uh and so if you understand that and and understand the other benefits uh yet only 70% of lipedema patients regularly wear uh uh compression and that's that's from a, a study by uh, Lisa uh McIntyre um and though in that study uh they also the ladies who did wear it uh, um, were, said that compression, uh, they felt supported, it reduced pain, and they uh, also improved, reported improved mobility. So, you know, why, where, where's, why is the dis disconnect? Well, it, you know, as, as Dr. Reddy already pointed out, um, that, um, you know, it takes, it's, it, it takes work to get uh, compression to work. Um, you know, it has to, uh, as she suggested, starting low and, um, you know, gradually improving, um, uh, gradually increasing the strength, sort of what we call a work-in period uh, can be very helpful. Um, and um, so, because as their legs are tender, sometimes just going to a, the super strongest, uh, the most uh, strongest compression may uh, actually, um, you know, be too much for them, and 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 also going over proper donning, uh, and then you know they have unique shapes, and um, so uh, they, you know, sometimes you have to have not just custom fit, or sometimes you have to have. We we do a lot of uh, knee highs and capris who those who have very large thighs but but maybe not as large calves and those sort of things uh, just lots of different ways uh, to um, to make it work for for uh, the lipedema patients. Um, that's just um, you know it, and it really should be medical grade and graduated because a lot of a, a lot of the ladies um, are are where just you know they'll, they'll say like oh well these are some athletic 
thing. Oh, it gives me compression. Well, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the stuff isn't really medical grade and graduated. And we do really find the biggest benefits with the medical grade. Um, and then the types. Um, and, and so circular net, uh, uh, I'm sorry. So the circular net is least expensive um, and it, it works well, but it can get caught in in cuffs and lobules, flatten it obviously is less likely to get cut, cut caught in cuffs and lobules. And uh, and then there's the weaves. Uh, there's uh, several Italian uh, manufacturers that make uh, great weaves. And then the Velcro appliances, uh, those are those have great um, uh, working um, <clears throat> working uh, stiffness and uh, but but they are heavier and uh, expensive and and sometimes need adjustment. So, so now this, uh, so very much like um, uh, Dr. Fabio, Dr. Kamamoto, um, we, um, you know, we agree, agree in treating this comprehensively and first uh, approaching this as a, uh, with conservative treatment. And this is, this is, this was actually borrowed from uh, Dr. Abato with his permission is that uh, we do, uh, we, uh, we, we have them focus on, uh, on, on triggers of their inflammation uh, in diet and, um, and, um, and try and, um, because there is a cyclical nature and uh, uh, of the, uh, of the lipedema inflammation and uh, compression and diet are anti-inflammatory. So with the compression and, and diet, we try and, you know, decrease those, those, um, those triggers and, and improve their um, uh, life with that. And then, um, and then it, if, um, and that, that really should be done before we uh, do any surgery um, and, because obviously you don't want to do surgery in the middle of an inflammatory peak. Uh, you, I mean, it's theoretically could be, um, could worsen uh, uh, symptoms. Um, uh, and then I just want to um, invite uh, everybody, all the listeners and, and uh, about uh, the, li the Lipedema World uh, um, Alliance is having a Congress um, in uh in potsdam berlin um uh, in october october 5th through 7th so anybody interested uh, uh this is this is the official uh invitation thank you very much for your attention excellent excellent that was a great presentation and thank you very much and i'm sorry to trigger plenty of question from fabio and from our uh, uh, co-panelists but uh, let me start by my co-moderator tracy um uh, do you have any question question or comments tracy i do actually thank you thank you dr Wright. that was a really interesting presentation i've certainly picked up quite a few things that are now turning the cogs in my mind um, as I go on, but you mentioned about using the IPC treatment for these for the patients, and you said that you found that there was an increase in the hip area. And given that you were talking about the interstitial water, etc., do you, did the patients just wear thigh high um, garments, or did they wear like a, a pair of trousers? And would that maybe have had a bit of a difference in what you found? Yeah, um, great question. And I, um, so the they were in compression from their uh, from their feet to their uh, at least the forefoot to their waist. So the compression garment, I don't think was. I think I, I think that the what we we saw there was the intermittent um, pneumatic compression um, uh, moved some of the fluid from the legs to the hips, and um, but. Uh, I don't, um, I can't, you know, we didn't have any, any uh, way to prove that, but that's my theory. Thank you. That's just where I was sort of coming from. Was it more a shift of fluid rather than um, anything else that had caused that increase? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll take the two poll question and then we have a question from uh, um, from Fabio and we have another question from uh, Dr. Reddy. So the first poll question, uh, what advantages does compression therapy have to lipidemia? 
reduces swelling, enhance movement, it helps to stop more tissue damage or all of the above. So this is the first part question. And in the meantime, let me have a quick question to Mr. Thomas. What is the inflammatory marker do you think is the best to judge inflammation in uh, lipidine? Wow. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know that there is a great, it's not been identified. I don't, okay. um, I, 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 you know, we, I've looked at CRPs and, and things like that. And I just, um, I, 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 I don't know. Um, it's okay. a great question. <laughs> That's all right. So uh, I can see that 79% got the answer correct, which is all of the above, which is nice. And the second poll question, <clears throat> second poll question, in whom should compression therapy never be used to lipidemia? And this is very important. Those who suffer from a skin disorder like eczema or psoriasis, those who experience circulation issue, individual with latex allergy, or all of the above? That's, a, that's an important question, uh, important understanding. And uh, let me remind that hopefully at the end, we'll have from each of the speaker and the panelists uh, a take home message, uh, because this subject is not really well studied. There is no much uh, worldwide consensus about it. So hopefully we'll try to grasp what is most up to date into that field from uh, this global uh, expertise opportunity. So I'm just filling the 30 seconds that is uh, for the answer of this question. Okay. Well, it's a kind of. Uh, well, <laughs> it's a mixture, yes. It's a mixture, yes. Some people who have seen ischemia, uh, so these are 34% said ischemia. Uh, others who have seen uh, psoriasis or maybe they are dermatologists, they will say 17%. Well, the la latest one is allergy latex, uh, which is only 3%, but again, majority got it correct, which is all of the above 45%. Thank you very much, and uh, let me uh, put the mic to Fabio, and after that, ready. Fabio, your question to Thomas. Uh, Thomas, I believe that you have a, a big uh, experience with compression. Uh, does the patient have to do it for the whole life, or do you believe that it's important in the beginning of the treatment, and then she may be freed sometimes from the, the, the compression? That's a great question. And I, I actually agree. I think you mentioned this and I agree with you that, that, that uh, they are likely, there's no actual cure for, for lipedema. And I do believe that they are, they will need some compression uh, for their whole life. Now they may need less, but I still think um, that, that it's uh, that they should be encouraged to continue it their whole life. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Reddy was raising her hand. Uh, if you have a question, Dr. Reddy for Professor Thomas. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for such an informative presentation. Uh, well, I am a lymphedema therapist as well as I'm a very proud women's health physiotherapist. So from a women's health physiotherapist perspective, I have a question regarding compression during pregnancy. So are there any modifications required with respect to compression in a patient with lipedema who is also pregnant? If yes, what are those modifications? Thank you. Well, they, they, they would uh, certainly uh, or later on in the, in the pregnancy, they're going to need a maternity style uh, compression that's going to have increased, you know, uh, um, in, in increased size in the in the abdomen um and um uh, and some some there are some sometimes that cannot tolerate it in late uh late late stages of pregnancy but uh otherwise uh um you know we we still encourage it uh if they become pregnant uh so what about the uh, compression class do we encourage class two compression itself just like other lipedema patients or do we prescribe class 
Oh, that's a great question. I, I, you know, I'm not a, I, I generally early on, I think they can still do the class two and, and, and maybe, uh, I, I actually don't know if it needs to be adjusted. Uh, I, I would be interested in your thoughts. Okay. okay. So, uh, my dearest, uh, uh, Mrs. Faber, uh, Gabriella, do you have any question to, uh, Professor Thomas? Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for this presentation. Again, I go along with, with I think, every, everything you said. I, I would like to agree with you that it is important to choose the right material. Um, and it's not always necessary to, um, to start off with that niche, but, you know, in a young patient with rather slim legs, this is, by the way, one, one, one point that I would like to, to stress. Um, We've seen those um, cases by uh, Fabio, and they were really impressive. But we have also got young patients, slim patients. The legs are not really, I mean, in, 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 in jeans or trousers, you wouldn't even see they've got lymphedema, but they've got the pain. So the pain is the symptom that's most important and, and must give us reason to, to try to treat those patients. Uh, I always, uh, I'm, I'm not happy about um, reducing it to the, the fat volume because on, on a visual analog scale, um, and also um, there's an ongoing study in Germany uh, by, uh, by a pain, uh, uh, by pain um, researchers, they found that the pain is not, does not depend on the size of the volume, but it, 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 you know, it's independent of that. But um, coming back to my point, so in that young patient with more or less normal proportions, you could start off with round knit stockings. But as you said, Thomas, afterwards, when there are lobules and, 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 and uh, foes, you, you need to, to, to find the, the proper flat knit. And we in Germany were in a very privileged situation, I think, because compression is fully covered by the, by the system. Um, so there's no problem. And we as doctors decide which type of um, compression. Um, I have a question for you, Thomas, before I go on with my comments. Um, I would like to know in, in that um, by uh, uh, the, the impedance, impedance study um, you did, did you record the hormonal phases? Can you say? You know, in, in that bio impedance study you did. Yeah. Um, did you record, did you take note of the cycle, of the hormonal cycle? Because I, I do I do it. Um, all my patients who are on nutritional therapy get a bioimpedance um, analysis every every few weeks, and I've discovered that there's huge difference whether they're pre pre um, yeah. um, menstrual or PMS or after or at ovulation, and that is why I find it so difficult to 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 judge the bioimpedance. Um, you know, I've got a similar system and I, I really like it very much, but very often you find changes that you can't really explain, or maybe you can explain by hormonal, uh, by the hormonal situation. So did you take, take note of that? Uh, so no, no, we didn't. Um, and, and that's a great, great point. Um, I think that, um, you know, the only thing I can say is that we, we did do it at, uh, at monthly intervals. So we were consistent, at least in the calendar month, but I, I mean, not every, every yeah. lady is regular on exactly on the calendar, but, but many are. And so that might, uh, yeah, but that's a, that, that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to take note every time, which, which, um, day of the cycle they are on, but, um, uh, so yeah, the next the next comment I've got is about inflammation. Uh, you know, Tom, there are two there are two debates raging. Um, the one is about the, the interstitial interstitial fluid, um, yeah. and and I found I found it very interesting. Um, you found, uh, as Tracy said, there is an increase at at the uh, uh, hips, and I think that might due to to the um, you know the sort of lifting, wrong expression, uh, you know, uh, moving, moving the, 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 the interstitial fluid. Um, yeah. I'm a strong believer in interstitial, in interstitial fluid. And again, there's strong opposition to that. I'm a, I'm a, a, a huge um, fan of GAGs um, because they, they can contain a lot of fluid without yeah. us 
being able to 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 see it on long, uh, on 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 the ultrasound. You know, I did a study myself, and we found we couldn't see any fluid on the ultrasound, but we don't need to see it. And I have many patients who report um, they can't pull on pull up their genes at night. The same genes they were perfectly able to pull up um, um, in the morning. And we're actually just starting um, a study, a, a multicenter study. We, we planned it, we have not really got, got, got going, but I do hope we will. We want patients to measure their thighs in the mornings and in the evenings, because this is something that um, meets that opposition from the Black Forest. They say there's no fluid there, and there is, otherwise you can't explain that. You know, so I think that that, that is something we should all try, and and we should try to to research to have more to do more research on on the fluid really, because there's this strong opinion um, there's no fluid in lipedema. It's called there's no edema in lipedema, but maybe we we need to call it. Um, Thomas, I think we are going to meet at, at the end of August and we'll discuss that. I think maybe we need to find a new term for edema that is not in the, the lymphatic system or that, that is not, um, uh, you know, you can't. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 One yeah, that's a very, yeah, very important point. Uh, we, we have made also the uh, uh, variation between morning and evening regarding venous reflux in nurses. Mm -hmm. And we found that 50% uh, of them develop reflux during the evening, which is not in the morning. So even the diurnal variation from the venous side of things also confirm your point. So this is a good study to do. But yeah. that is, that is uh, easy to explain. We call it orthostatic edema which we don't yeah. see. We, we don't see that on the ultrasound either, by the way. But yeah. I don't think that can explain the swelling at the thigh. You know, orthostatic is below the knee. And uh, how can, if it was orth orthostatic purely, it would probably go down all the way um, to, to the ankle. I've got one last um, 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 comment on the uh, in, in, inflammation, because you asked. Um, I have been trying to see, to look at CRP. I can't, I, it's inconsistent completely. Um, there is um, a, a study group in Germany, Leipzig. They seem to have found a slight elevation in CRP. I can't with my patients. Um, there are studies that found in pro-inflammatory cytokines like um, uh, interleukins and, and uh, of course, um, macrophages called um, uh, um, uh, what what are they called? Um, um, uh, Crown-like structures. Um, yeah. As our, our chief anatomist Erich Brenner uh, maintains, that does not yet prove inflammation. It's pro-inflammatory, but it doesn't. There hasn't been uh, the, uh, uh, the proof of proper inflammation. So I think that's another field of research that we have to uh, have in mind. And as Tom said, we, we founded the uh, Libidema World Alliance um, last year, and um, I think there's a, there's a lot of expertise among these members, and we are going to try and, um, and, and motivate our members to go on with doing research, I think that's most important. We need facts. We don't need opinions. We don't yeah. need paradigms. We need facts. You do. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. That is great. And uh, I think uh, there is one of the attendee raising his hand. Uh, I think he wants to put his question verbally, uh, we, which is Adrian Soraya. Uh, you can go ahead. I think you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Adrian Soraya, uh, who has raised his hand. From the attendee, you can ask your question. I'm sure the moderator will uh, will open your mic. <clears throat> Let's see that I can't. In the meantime, I would like to hello. announce. Yes, hello. hello. Yes, you can speak. Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, thank you, I am Dr. Surya from Indonesia. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Go ahead. 
I like to ask question from the <clears throat> speakers. Is there connection of insulin resistance and lipidemia? Because now insulin resistance is a common platform for diabetes, hypertension, also Alzheimer, also uh, cancer. So do you think lipidemia also has that factor before they go so so serious? So in the early stage of lipidemia, can they then prevent by diet that is no sugar? Thank you. Okay, so I will get you all the expertise. I will get you four answer to your question. Our two speaker, our two panelists. So Fabio, uh, you can start. Well, uh, I'm not sure about the, the answer, but what I believe, and this is my personal um, impression, is that there is no relation between these diseases because uh, it's interesting to see that uh, although these patients have a lot of amount of fat on the legs, I do not see usually metabolic disease here. So they, they do not have diabetes. They do not usually have high cholesterol. They do not have a uh, high pressure. So what I believe that interestingly, uh, there is no relation between this metabolic disease and the fat of the legs. So I okay. believe there is no relation, but this is my okay. personal opinion. No problem. Dr. Thomas? Yeah, I I uh, I actually think it's maybe the opposite. I think uh, the the gynecological fat that in the hips and and thighs uh, may actually be uh, per protective or in more insulin sensitive. But uh, you know, I, I think uh, if a secondary obesity occurs, then 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 I think they they get insulin resistance just like everybody else. Yeah, Gabriella. Yes, I, I fully agree. I did. Um, I looked at my own patients, and I found that if you compare, if you match lipidema patients with obese patients by their BMI, which one shouldn't do, then lipidema patients always get have better met metabolic um, values. And there is um, a, a study group in 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 Saxonia in 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 Leipzig. Uh, they did a very comprehensive study and they found that there was less risk for um, insulin resistant resistance and diabetes in lipidema. As Tom said, it's the, gyne gyne um, the, the, the female fat areas that seems to provide a sort of um, um, a protection. But when there is abdominal obesity, and that is the case in, in, in many women, then that advantage get, gets lost. And then there's another aspect which I think is why my um, favorite diet, the ketogenic diet is still, still works. And it, it, that is the, the, the diet that reduces insulin as much as possible. We, yeah. think, we think that um, the, adip the lipidema adipocytes um, are different from ordinary adipocytes, even in the, in the gynoid regions. And they probably, probably they um, are, they are less ready to, to um, shed their fat, their fatty acids. So even in a normal, um, at normal levels of insulin, they are still able to store fat, or they are able to, to, to store more fat, and they are not able to, 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 um, to shed it again. So although yeah. there's no insulin resistance, there is a stronger answer to uh, lower levels of insulin. That's my my opinion, and I think there is some scientific evidence for that. Okay, and Dr. Reddy? Uh, well, I'm not sure of whether insulin resistance per se leads to lipidema, but I believe in the opposite, uh, the other way around, that is lipidema can lead to a sedentary lifestyle due, due to their difficulty in leading um, a normal active lifestyle, and that may lead to insulin resistance. Right. Me, yeah. That's a point. Also, Tracy, she's an experienced NHS head nurse for a long time. You remember, Tracy, when we see 
a young diabetic injecting insulin, we see lipodystrophy, which is atrophy to lipid in the local site of injection. So this hormone is really fascinate me. So what's your answer question, Tracy? I really don't have a full answer on it. I think, again, the discussion is, you know, what comes first, that, that chicken yeah. or egg sort of situation, isn't it, really? Um, yeah. I do see, um, I've had some diabetic patients who I have sort of, I have seen much more distribution around that area. But again, that's just a clinical observation. There hasn't been any studies on that. Um, but I would, um, I would be, you know, would welcome a lot more, sort of comment discussion around it because i do think yeah. this is a topic that you know we we can't ignore um, yeah absolutely yeah in okay it, really. and um so um we, we have plenty of question uh, i'm sorry uh, to Dr. exhaust Omar, you Thomas. yes i have few comments about uh, dr wright's um presentation if i may yes please please go ahead yeah uh, so first of all, it's about uh, the style, uh, uh, the uh, type of uh, compression garment that is used. Uh, so I personally feel that pantyhose is better than uh, either knee-high or thigh-high uh, garments, especially uh, for various reasons, but especially because it gives a gradual transition. And when we use either knee-high or thigh-high uh, garments, it ends abruptly and it also tends to roll down. Another reason is it does not give a proper um, support to the, uh, an anchoring support to the limb. So I feel pantyhose uh, would be uh, the right garment. And uh, another uh, comment would be, owing to the already existing tenderness in the extremities, uh, the affected extremities, even if there is slightest gathering of the, uh, I mean, if there is any wrinkles in the compression garment, that could lead to pain which would ultimately affect patient's compliance. Uh, therefore, to choose the right garment and uh, right fit becomes very important, along with uh, teaching the patients to master the art of donning and doffing also uh, is very important to ensure the compliance. So this was my last comment. Thank you. Can I just add into that? I think, um, Dr. Eddie, definitely, I think fit, material, comfort is all really important in actually getting our patients to comply uh, with wearing compression and it's often that very problem that actually puts them off wearing the compression for life and that's when we start to see more problems so I, I would definitely agree with those comments. Um, Dr Thomas I don't know exactly. whether you want to um, comment. Yeah, no, matter, no matter how much of evidence-based multidisciplinary approach we give at the end of the day, if the patient is not compliant, I feel uh, the pay, uh, we are not going to achieve the end goal. So yeah, sure. yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I my my response is uh, thank you. That I I agree with you. Um, and pantyhose are the best uh, in that they give the 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 com the the complete coverage, but. But sometimes uh, we have some people that are so disproportionate, have such smaller calves and um, that we will do a capri and layer that with um, with like a, a knee high and, and with an overlap. And, and we do find that uh, can work like uh, in. in Dr. Uh, Kamamoto's uh, one of the one that one paid the warrior the warrior at the end with the very large uh, hips and but 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 relatively smaller um, uh, calves uh, that he showed uh, that she would be someone that maybe wouldn't fit in a in a in a panty a regular pantyhose unless it was custom made. Absolutely. So we got here an important question from the uh, attendee from Louise Patiolo. Um, uh, his question is for lipidemia, what class compression do you use? Would you consider 40 millimeter per kid to this patient? Can you use a higher pressure as with lymphedema? I think this is an important question. So I will put it to Thomas and Fabio. Start Thomas. Well, we we generally use uh, class two or, or like twenty to twenty millimeters of mercury to thirty. Um, now, if they have 
secondary they have a lot of secondary lymphedema and then we might we might we might go up uh, and we do go up uh to uh uh you know 30 to 40 uh but but generally we use class 2 uh, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury okay and uh, fabio is it the same yeah i agree with thomas we usually start with 20 to 30 millimeters and what it's it's rare to see the the, the lesion of the, the lymphatic. So we we do not use higher compression garments usually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here we got a question from uh, Lucy Melikan. Uh, can you please clarify the question about who compression should never be used on? Was anyone with circulation issue should never be used? Uh, I think because maybe this question was not elaborated. Uh, if you have problem with vascular, like arterial insufficiency, or you got ischemia, and you have used improper compression, you can get gangrene. So this is, I think, what we meant by, by this question. So if you have um, an arterial insufficiency, it's one of the contraindication to uh, compression. Um, we got another question uh, from Edwin Stefan. Uh, please share experience with wraps for compression. Would your compression therapy help instead of stocking? So this question to Thomas. Uh, so... Sometimes, I mean, we do wraps occasionally, but more often we use uh, um, just the compression garments. But we, we, and sometimes we use reduction kits uh, as well. Um, but, but the uh, the uh, complete decongestive therapy with the sequential wraps, we use we use that less often. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Fabio, do you like to add to your expertise to this question? Yeah, yeah, it's rare to use reps, but I, I see a paper in that, especially after the surgery, because after the surgery, the volume of the legs sh uh, shrinks a lot and very fast. So uh, reps would be an, an option for us to, to adjust the, the, the garment during this post-op um, period. So maybe it's a good idea. Okay. So yeah, I will take some with that. Yeah. Yes, please, please. No, I was just going to say, because that way then you can chase down the yeah. side of the limb without having to constantly remeasure, remeasure and get the hosiery for, for the for the patient. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I will take the last question, uh, which is from Els Brover. Uh, remark regarding compression and pregnancy and skin disease. Compression clasps are not the most important as we have a standard in the world. Those four standards differ in the amount of millimeter mercury. The material is more important, and in pregnancy, you don't want much compression on the belly area. So um, I think it's self-explanatory question. Do you like to add a comment, to Thomas? Um, no, I, th I, th I think that speaks for itself. Yeah, that's true. I agree. So, uh, because this topic is is very interesting, and because we don't have uh, um, evidence based uh, proof, the class A evidence of what is the best scenario to do, I would like to close uh, this meeting with a couple of minutes to each of the speaker, uh, my co-worker, my co-moderator, my excellent panelist, what is their views or what is the conclusion that we would like to send to the doctor? Because we in the MOH hub would like to be a, a global uh, enforcing this opini opinion and helping them to get a universal consensus. So let me start by Fabio, if you like to, what is take home message we have from this webinar? What I'd like to say is that we are working worldwide in the awareness of lipidzema. And this is so important because what I see every day here is a, a feeling of guilty, a feeling of not healthy, having hope in this situation. And I'm very happy with what was going on worldwide in terms of this. So I'd like to say that there is a hope for these patients. And I believe that we're just starting the work. So the lipidzema patients may have hope 
and they will get better every year because there are more technology, more studies, more doctors dedicating this time to this. So I believe that's going to be a, a completely situation about lipidema patients in 10 years. So. Okay, that's so great. That's great. So future is good. Thomas. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, 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 the whole the overall message is that this is a, uh, this disease can, should be treated comprehensively with diet, compression, and, and surgery, um, that it, it requires a multidisciplinary, um, uh, m m many medical professionals, uh, uh, nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, and uh, nutritionists, um, and um, that, uh, you know, with with these uh, with these treatments, uh, we they we can have uh, significant improvements in the quality of life of these individuals. That is excellent. And Gabriella, yes. sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And maybe if one thinks back ten years, that gives us hope because a lot has happened during actually the last four or five years. So I I, I trust that there will be new discoveries, new, new developments. Uh, my take home message is um, the ultimate goal, if you want to treat, if you treat uh, or treating lipidema patients is um, lessening the symptoms, reducing the pain. Whatever we do, whether we treat conservatively, that for instance is important in, in choosing the right compression, they don't normally need the, 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 the strongest, the hardest, but you have to reduce the, the pain and that's the, that's what's done through compression, through MOD, through um, nutrition. And that is what we, as, you, as all of you said, comprehensively together, it, it needs a village to raise a child, it needs the whole global community of experts to treat lipidema. Thank you. Excellent. And Dr. Reddy? Uh, well, when it comes to take home message, I have precisely five points. So the treatment should be always multidisciplinary as reflected by all the speakers and my co-panelists today. Uh, appropriate and adequate counseling regarding the nature of disease and its prognosis should be included. A realistic goal setting should be followed. Mental health should be equally considered as much as their physical health. Uh, and last, last but not the least, the, uh, the treatment should progress at a rate that is not too overwhelming for the patient so as to ensure the compliance. Thank you. Excellent. And my uh, excellent co-moderator, Aver, uh, do you have a question to answer the rap as well? And you can give us your fantastic uh, take-home message. Um, yeah, with regards to the wraps, definitely I think there is a use for that after the, uh, the surgery. Um, not so much, I think, as an ongoing in terms of how people will manage to mobilise. I think we need to get something that's going to encourage them to move better. Um, but definitely after surgery, I think there is a place. My take home message really echoes quite a lot of what has been said here in that we do need a multidisciplinary approach. We need to be able to get compression that is comfortable, that the patients are going to feel cosmetically happy in. Um, and, you know, the layering, uh, as Dr. Thomas said, we often will do that to make it easier for them to apply the garments, actually using lots of different options like zips, et cetera, to it makes it easier for the application as well. And I think as much as we can do that um, from an industry point of view, then we can help the clinicians, we can help the patients out there to um, to become more compliant, concordant with their treatment as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm really grateful and happy for your uh, impact about this uh, significant uh, worldwide disease with different multi-continent uh, approach to it. And I hope to invite everyone to MOH platform either the website or YouTube to share your comment. I will put, I think there was a consensus about dealing with lipidemia in Europe, which was two years ago. Um, a lot of things have really changed it. And hopefully with the current research from Gabriella, from Fabio Smith, from India, all of this will put a hint on it. And hopefully with this document, it will give you the best clinical 
advice and I obviously also would like to invite you if you have a difficult case and you want to know which type of compression you need to use, which size, again, I would like to add you to join this general continuous 24 hour conversation. I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, the uh, the MOH talk today, and I hope it is of benefit to you and to your patient. I am sure it will play a lot in our clinical practice. I would like to uh, thank very much my uh, co-moderator, Tracy, for your time and your effort. And I would like to thank very much the great speakers from Brazil, from USA, to show the cutting edge technology with all tips and tricks. I'm very grateful to Gabriella. I know she had a lot of family commitment, uh, but uh, she insisted on attending this webinar. And that's is very grateful and Dr. Reddy from India. Uh, I'm uh, very thankful to the MOH team, Dr. Mahmoud Al Ghadban, Dr. Khalid Zidane for giving this international arena. I wish you all the best. I promise you to get you the next time the most cutting edge vascular knowledge available on the planet. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Okay.